So thank you all for coming to the Imagine Little Tokyo 2022 Writing Workshop. This program is presented by the Little Tokyo Historical Society in collaboration with Discover Nikkei, a project of JANM. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers, Mike Okamura and Edgar Award-winning author Naomi Hirohara from the Little Tokyo Historical Society. Hello, everyone. This is Naomi Hirohara, and I'm co-chair of the Imagine Little Tokyo Short Story Contest. And it's wonderful to have you all here. Um, you know, when we're, a lot of us are hunkered down, this is like the perfect time for us to use our imagination and travel in time and um, do a short story. Don't you agree? So um, I'm going to tell you briefly about today's format. Um, my colleague, Mike Okamura, is going to take us on a little tour of Little Tokyo, as well as talk about um, the area, both past and present. And as he's doing that, please have a little notebook next to you, or, you know, if you're good at typing on your phone or whatever, you know, do little um, notes. And it's more on if there's a, a certain image or a story or something a, a, a photo of a certain person that sparks something in you, just make a note of that. And we're going to have a very simple writing exercise at the end of the program. So um, you could refer to your notes for that. So, um, yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to start with my colleague, Michael Kamura. Okay, thank you, Naomi, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and I'm, I'm just so happy that you're participating in this writer's workshop. And why don't we just get started on this stroll down Little Tokyo memory lane. So here you can see a very familiar site. We're at the, the point of uh, First Street in Alameda, the very famous Yagura uh, watch, fire, fire watch tower. So, Let's, let's just imagine we're in, in a bubble of time, past, present, and future. You're probably not familiar with this site, but this is where First and Alameda is. To the left is the old Atomic Cafe, which was the punk rock scene in the 1990s. And then to the right, this old building is now where Janum uh, Pavilion is located. The background are the, the skyscrapers are still there, of course, but the names on those buildings are long gone. If you look straight down First Street, it's still the same. Okay, thank you, next. Uh, here, we go way back in time, over 100 years ago, 1918, where you see this streetcar already roaming down the grids of the city of LA through downtown. And this one probably went straight into Borough Heights. The bottom photo shows uh, the 1950s when car congestion was just as heavy as it is today in, in the, the Building to the right is the Japanese American National Museum Historic Building and now the Go For Broke National Education Center. Okay, very familiar scene here, but the one on the left, the vintage photo shows that uh, Central Avenue, which is now the plaza, has uh, buses being loaded by volunteers on the way to Manzanar Relocation Center. This, so this is around May when the first volunteers went to Lone Pine to build the barracks at Manzanar. Next, please. Uh, very familiar shots on the top right-hand corner. You have uh, Gopher Brook National Education Center and Janum on the right, but in the very back, you see City Hall, which will always be looming in the background of, of, pe of present and past photos. The bottom is a colorized postcard, which is very cool. And you can see the model A's and T's uh, this building, the, the former Nishi Honganji Buddhist Temple, was built in 1925, and it's a historic structure in itself. Next, please. Now, I love this one because uh, we're just familiar with the gold line, but many decades ago, up until here, 1963, the, the P line of the yellow cars were rambling down the street, down First Street, and this one also went to straight into Boyle Heights. That was the past, now going into the present and the future. You can see at the bottom slide where the regional connector station is located directly across from Janum on Central Avenue. So that will be opening sometime this, this year. Next. I like this, uh, this photo because it shows uh, 
a bunch, uh, a lot of information here, but it's all in Japanese. So if you could read Japanese, katakana, particularly Kingu, was a record, a record uh, press label. And this is uh, uh, along First Street where the original connector station uh, is being constructed. And in the bottom is the Japanese Village Plaza. So as you're strolling down, just imagine walking down and you could see what this, this older type of business was like. Okay, here, uh, the top photo shows, uh, you can see that image, the signage of the Fuji Mountain, Mount Fuji. That was the Fujikon Theater, one of four movie, movie houses in Little Tokyo. So just imagine going there to watch samurai movies or the latest from Japan, and then going next door to Lem's Chop Suey Cafe, or even on the bottom photo, it shows the Ginza nightclub. So you could have gone there and had a drink after the movie too. Next. Here we have the Tokai Company on First Street, uh, which is a very familiar type of uh, setting for these open air markets, these little grocery stores. They, were, they abounded throughout the neighborhood as well as throughout uh, the city of LA. And you could pick up anything that you wanted. Little Tokyo Mall is a current photo. And this is where you can come and buy anything to do with anime or manga or cosplay. It's a very popular place because it's the Japanese culture district of Little Tokyo. Next. I love this photo too, because it shows you um, where City Hall is always looking down on Little Tokyo. And it could be, uh, over the decades, people think of it as a threat because City Hall, Civic Center, they're always looking to expand their footprint into Little Tokyo. But this photo, this vintage photo shows on both sides of Weller Street, which is now Onizuka Street, or really uh, astronaut Onizuka had many small businesses. And now it's a pedestrian walkway. Next. This is a great photo because this large building, uh, two large buildings at one point up until the late 60s, uh, they existed. And the one on the left was the Tao building, which housed many uh, professional, uh, professional uh, individuals with accountants, uh, CPS, uh, attorneys and such. But in this building on the ground, the basement floor was uh, pool hall, Frank's pool hall. So if you can imagine uh, kind of some shady business going down there as well. Uh, and then to the right was the old Miyako Hotel, which was known as the Civic Hotel during the Bronzeville era. Next. And speaking about the Bronzeville era, that was 1942 to 45 when Little Tokyo was emptied out of the Japanese American community because they were removed and put into the concentration camps during the World War II. And in its place, uh, the, the black community moved in and just kind of made Little Tokyo their home. And it was known as the Bronzeville, Bronzeville. Uh, and kind of a remnant of that is the finale club where you see on the top right photo, it was a breakfast club, jazz club. And that building was on first street between San Pedro and Los Angeles street. Next here. Uh, I think it's amazing to just to think about strolling down little Tokyo. You look through alleyways and streets and you'll, you will invariably come across some religious institution. Little Tokyo is home to eight religious institutions, five Buddhist temples and three Christian churches. And they're all very distinct architectural styles and of the Buddhist sect. And here on the bottom left is the Japanese Catholic Church. Next. This is also fascinating to me and it's close to my heart because I'm, I'm trying to do more research. Uh, it's the Inari Shinto Shrine or in Japanese, Inari Jinja. This existed pre-war Little Tokyo. It's, it existed probably right after post-war, but then it was demolished because it became a parking lot. But there were two, at least two Shinto shrines in Little Tokyo pre-war. Just fascinating. Next, please. Here we have the, take a look at the uh, top left hand, hand corner. Uh, imagine just strolling down First Street in the 19, for the 1932 Olympics, when the Japanese athletic team came into the neighborhood, the Japanese American community really turned out 
in large numbers to just celebrate their presence. And uh, they did very well in that Olympics. On the bottom is uh, iconic buildings, the Kajime building to the right, which which housed at one point uh, a very well-known Japanese restaurant called Horikawa. And then the left is the Doubletree Hotel, which is which was the very famous the New Otani Hotel and Garden. Next. Uh, here we have uh, solemn areas, a little Tokyo as well. These two sites are dedicated to the uh, Nisei veterans and the Japanese vet American veterans throughout the wars. Uh, to the left is the Gopher Brook National Monument. And to the right is the Japanese American National War Memorial Court at the JACCC. Uh, and, and directly behind that is the Japanese Union Church, or sorry, the Union Church, formerly known as Japanese Union Church. Next, please. Uh, and here we have to the left, the Japanese Union Church, uh, as it was known when it was opened in 1923. And now it houses the Union Center for the Arts. Uh, this is where my paternal grandparents got married in 1927. But there's also known to have, uh, this building has spirits or ghosts, very friendly ghosts. So uh, it, it's, it's one of my favorites too. And then this 95 year old Aoyama tree, this was adjacent to the old uh, Daishi mission, which later, later became known as the Koyasan Buddhist temple on first street. And then the sculpture to the left is uh, of the three Japan towns. The one that's facing you is the little Tokyo. On the other sides are Japantown, San Francisco and Japantown, San Jose. And then of course, there's City Hall. Next, please. This is uh, First Street North where when you're walking down, imagine walking by these stores and, and just wondering what's inside. Asahi Shoe Store, where these gentlemen are on the, the kind of the ledge, that was a shoe store there for decades. And then you can see to the right, uh, Granada Fish Market. Everyone used to go there for fresh food, uh, seafood. And, and you would come across your friends and you know take some time to chat. Uh, on, on the bottom is the little Tokyo uh, Visitor Center or uh, commonly known as the Koban. And next to that is Anzen Hardware 75th anniversary. Thank you, next. So here we see the hustle and bustle of little Tokyo, probably from the 50s on the corner of First and San Pedro Street. They're doing their daily activities. Maybe they're going to work. Maybe they're going to dinner, uh, catch a movie. And here, Ida Market is on the, the north side of First Street, an, another open air type of uh, market. And to the right of that is the, the former uh, Nicolo Chapsui House. And not in the picture is the old Far East Cafe Chapsui House too. There were plenty of these Chinese, Japanese, Chinese restaurants, uh, Japanese restaurants. Okay. Now we have our beloved and iconic Bunkado gift shop. Um, you know where this is at? It's at the crosswalk on First Street. Uh, and the original signage here, the neon sign is still on that building and it's still fired up, uh, I think, every day. Uh, it's just really a, a beautiful picture to see how lovingly this, this business has been celebrating 75 years. Next. Okay, very little known is about uh, the Azusa Street Mission and Revival. This was founded in 1906 and it really started the worldwide Pentecostal movement. So the original structure here was just beyond this low line wall on the other side of the Japanese American Culture and Community Center Plaza. So if you walk by San Pedro Street, you could see a signage on the lamppost and uh, you'll see what, what used to be there, this building. Next, please. And the bookmobile. Everyone who grew up in an era knew about the bookmobile. They plied the roads of the city of LA or the county of LA. But at one time, Little Tokyo did not have a library. Now we do. It's on First and uh, Los Angeles Street. And you can go there for the latest uh, books and magazines and even videos in the Japanese language. But back then, there was no library. So you had the, the library take come to the neighborhood. And you could see here, these ladies are dressed in kimono. So this is probably during the Nisei Week Japanese Festival in August. Next. 
uh, Toyo Miyatake. He was a very famous photographer, um, mostly known for his iconic work shot at Manzanar Camp, which is where his family was uh, incarcerated during World War II. And just as where my uh, father was with his family and my great grandparents on my mother's side with their family. But the, the uh, Toy Miyatake studio was in Little Tokyo up until the mid 90s, and now they're in San Gabriel Valley. Four generations of Miyatake still operating the business. Next. Uh, I like this picture a lot because it shows you kind of the, just the daily life of Little Tokyo during the 50s and 60s. To the left is the uh, former Kyoto drug. It was a hamburger joint. And just on the other side of the, the counter, uh, outside of the shot, is the pharmacy. So it was also a Kyoto drugstore. And the Tani family operated this business for a few decades. Uh, to the right, we have Kinema Theater. There, as I mentioned, there were four theaters in Little Tokyo. So just imagine. Uh, before the, the movie or after the movie, you went to Kyoto Drug and got yourself uh, a malt shake and a hamburger. Next. Uh, this, this is really a festive photo because it's during Nisei Week along First Street uh, during the 1970s. And in the background is Rafu Busan Company, a famous gift shop that's in their sec 62nd year. And now it's in Honda Plaza and it's got that uh, well-known orange signage. Next. Now, remember I mentioned that during World War II, Little Tokyo was uh, abandoned. The Japanese Americans were in the concentration camps and it became known as Bronzeville. This is uh, pretty much right after the Japanese had left and be before the African-American population moved in. So there was, there was no one and no one was in Little Tokyo. But now you see uh, the very well-known first, first side of uh, First Street, the National Historic Landmark District. And it was Little Tokyo's deemed a California cultural district in 2017. So just you know, walking around here, you feel the presence of all these people from the past decade. Next. Uh, this is a fun photo because it shows you what you would see in Japan these replica foods. And you know, if you're not familiar with the photo of the food itself, what you could do is just uh, go inside and bring the waitress out and point to the food that you wanna order. This is very popular or very common in Japan. And then to the, law, uh, to the top left is the Kawafuku uh, Sukiyaki House, but it was also known as the first sushi bar in, in the United States. And on the second floor, they had Japanese entertainment. The, the uh, waitresses were uh, attired in kimono. It's a very kind of classy joint. Next, please. All right, so I hope these images sparked something in you that you're gonna say, yeah, you know, I wanna write my short story about little Tokyo with something from these photos. And I know that the next time you're in Little Tokyo, or if you've never been in Little Tokyo, hopefully the photos I shared with you as we strolled down memory lane, um, it, it, it just thought that, okay, I could write this story. Just imagine that you were in that time frame that uh, we were all there together. Thank you so much and good luck with your writing. Thank you so much, Mike, for putting that all together. I know it's a lot of work. Um, so what I'm going to, uh, this, this workshop is actually going to be a little focused on historical fiction, but it doesn't mean your short story has to be historical. But we wanted to offer something that was a little different from last year's workshop you're free and encouraged to um, go to YouTube and type in Discover Nikkei. Actually, when you registered, there should have been um, a link to the um, our last year's workshop. And in that workshop, we talked about using the five senses. So, you know, uh, think of not only using your sight, but maybe hearing or smell, those kind of things when you write. We talked about inciting incidents, that something has to happen. Something has to be like the match that starts the fire, right? So you, and gets the action going. 
Um, and the last thing we talked about last year was a rubric, which a lot of teachers use. And basically it's telling you, it, uh, it gives you a grid of evaluation. And this is something that all the judges and the judges usually rotate every year. They kind of uh, look at that and see, okay, does this um, sh short story, does it uh, use imaginative language? So that would be like the highest score or do they, re do they, are they just regurgitating a movie? You know, that would be a low sto score. So if you'd like to see that scoring sheet or rubric, you can go to the little Tokyo historic site um, website. And there's, um, if you go to the sh uh, short story section, there's, uh, it says rubric, and you could um, link on that and take a look if that would be helpful to you. But um, yeah, last year, um, in August, um, I came out with my first historical novel, which is called Clark and Division, which follows the Japanese American family from a neighborhood in Los Angeles called A uh, it, back then it was called Tropico, but it's called Atwater today, to Manzanar, finally to Chicago. And so because um, that was actually, even though I have a love of history and have written a lot of nonfiction, historical nonfiction, that was my first attempt at writing historical fiction. So I thought I would um, kind of... Uh, uh, focus our talk today in that area, and you could still take some of these hint, uh, tips and in, incorporate it in whether you want to set something in the future or maybe contemporary. But um, so how what, how do you decide on what to write about? And for me, it's like just like watch uh, going through Mike's slides. Was there anything that sparked your curiosity? that was surprising or somehow um, gave you a sense of wonder. And whenever I'm reading nonfiction books, you know, those are the things that indicate to me that there's something more I can investigate. And another thing to be looking at um, when you're trying to decide on what to write about, is there something that there's a lot of gaps. Like maybe there was something that happened so long ago, like the first sushi bar or whatever, the first Japanese restaurant, like there's really, it, there's not much there, you know, to, in terms of nonfiction documents. So I think that's when um, we as uh, creatives have to come in and use our imagination. Um, I've read some historical fiction and it seems like they totally lifted someone's like uh, nonfiction account and just like stuck it, you know, into their story. And it's not fun to read, you know, it has to be entertaining. So um, you have to look at something that, you know, we don't know that much. So that's our role as creative writers to you know, fill in the gaps. And the third thing is that's very important is to choose the right character and give that uh, character the, uh, the voice. And, and it has to be a unique voice that perhaps we, we're the only ones that could give that character a voice. And I will get more into that. Let's see. So, okay, you're thinking, how can I do some online research? Like you, it's hard to actually go into libraries now. So what can you do? There's a lot of online resources. And I also want to invite, I don't know if they've done that. Um, let's see uh, if members of the Japanese American National Museum has links. I know we have some members of Discover Nikkei. Discover Nikkei actually is a great repository of a lot of um, little Tokyo stories. So you, if you're interested in one of these topics, you might Google Discover Nikkei in the topic. The things that kind of have helped me right now, I'm doing a follow-up to Clark and Division. And this next book is set in Los Angeles and uh, specifically Boyle Heights, um, Little Tokyo, Burbank, 
in Pasadena. Um, but the things in, uh, well, actually all of those areas, what it, what's been helpful is for me to uh, look at the place I used to work at, the Rafu Shinpo, which is a Japanese American newspaper was started in 1903. Their archives are now available it digitized online from the Los Angeles Public Library, but you do need a library card. So if you live out of state, you might be out of luck, but that's um, if you go under um, LAPL.org and under the database tab, it'll lead you um, to the archives. And that's a, has been a wonderful resource for me. I'm looking at things from 1946 and I could just, you know, it's keyword searchable. Uh, Pacific uh, Citizen also have uh, archives and it's um, separated by decade. So if you want to do something in the 1980s, you could search from there. Um, in terms of photos, because for me, many times, when I look at a certain photograph, it sparks that interest, curiosity, wonder that I was talking about. So you, if you go to Calisphere, uh, University of California, they have a lot of interesting photos. Same with Shades of L.A. Um, Densho, um, the, you know, they're wonderful. They have all the camp newspapers. They have all sorts of stories. They have an encyclopedia as well. And L.A. County Library, um, they also have the camp newspapers and some camp documents. So that could be really helpful. Okay, so what do you want to avoid when you're writing historical fiction? And one thing is what I referred to before is that the textbook, you know, uh, very, it, very staid. It's not really a story. It's like reciting facts. And that's kind of like an info dump, right? It, you kind of know like, okay, the writer is trying to teach me something. You really want to avoid that because we're writing fiction. One of the um, points of writing fiction is we're trying to entertain people. Another thing you want to avoid is cliche dialogue, especially when you're writing a period piece, you might, you know, not really understand how people spoke, but you saw like a 1940s movie and now you try to emulate that. And you, you kind of want to stay away from that. And then um, the fourth thing is you want to avoid a lack of a unique story involving characters. Okay, let me, let me explain a little bit more about that. Let's say like for my Let's for Clark and Division, for example, you know, this was a story of a family who's going, you know, through the World War II incarceration experience and lands in Chicago. So that's a very common story. You know, it wasn't in our community, although in the larger world, it's kind of unique and unknown in terms of our community. It's not. So there needs to be some other story besides that that can pull the reader through. In my case, I wrote about sisters. Um, and it's a, a story told from the younger sister who's always in the shadow of her older sister. So what happens if that older sister is gone from the family? Will the younger sister be able to pull her, you know, to step in her older sister's shoes? What, you know, so that's a, a really major part of the story. So when you're tackling something like this, it can't just be situational. It can't just be the context. It has to also be, what is it about these particular characters? So let, so what, um, what do I mean about creating characters? Like you need a protagonist um, that has some kind of weakness, problem, or challenge. And a protagonist with a goal. That protagonist wants to get something done. And then what do you, in addition to a protagonist, you need an antagonist. And sometimes people, you know, they use um, nature and other things. I mean, that's a possibility, but to make it simple, let's use another person. And that person kind of threatens the completion of that goal. So that's kind of what you need when you're creating a story. You need a problem, you know, and you need um, some sort of conflict and inciting incident. Now, when you're um, trying, if, if you're having problems like 
kind of get into the head of characters, what you can do is you can maybe interview someone. And even if you're doing something historical, like in my case, I had to interview some of my friends who were younger sisters because I'm an older sister. I don't know everything there is about being a younger sister. So I had to interview someone. So if you write in a character that's a different age, you know, different gender, you know, you might have to engage in in some conversation, do it over Zoom or a phone call and to kind of get into your head, get into the head of the character more. Um, So what about dialogue and voice what hap- if you're doing a historical novel or a short story you might try to find books or correspondence that were written during that era letters you know and what i i what i really enjoy is reading letter love letters like how did like the nisei men you know when during world war ii when they were you know writing their girlfriends how did you know they sound and um, and if you're really challenged, like I, I wrote my novel in the first person because I really wanted to get into the head of my character. And if you're really having a problem, um, you could use third person, you know, so there's a little bit of distance, but it's OK. And then you could and for the dialogue, just use very plain dialogue. It doesn't have to be um, you don't have to use a certain dialect or anything. Um, and then another question when you're writing historical fiction, is there some distance between the story and when it's told? What do I mean by that? Like, for instance, for Clark and Division, I'm imagining kind of an, a woman who's older telling the story in first person when she was in her 20s. You could also tell that story um, in first person, a person who's right there in her 20s telling the story. Now, why is that different? Um, it's different because when you're older, uh, writing about something that happened in the past, there's more reflection. You could add a little more context. Whereas if you're right there and then telling that, there's not going to be as much interpretation. And another um, challenge is, um, for instance, like uh, language, uh, uh, like the way you identify people of different ethnicities. If you're really in the head of that person at that historic time, you're going to have to use the language of the time, which is kind of it's a difficult challenge. And then also with dialogue, you know, I try to avoid um, pieces of dialogue that just say facts, like, you know, my father was a gardener, you know, blah, blah, you know, without any emotion, you know, it, there needs to be something there that it's, that has more of a point of view. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a little example. This is a short story that I wrote um, last year. And um, it's called Grand Garden. And um, it, these, you know, I'm primarily a crime writer, um, mystery writer. So uh, this was for a collection uh, um, about crime hits home, you know, things that hit somebody's home. So what I was kind of intrigued with was, uh, well, I've been going so much during the pandemic to Huntington gardens and library and gardens. And of course, one of the most famous spots there is the Japanese garden. And that initially that Japanese house came from, uh, it's called the uh, Marsh uh, Garden um, in, and it was in old Pasadena. And it was this, and this image was from 1908 and it was literally moved from this location to uh, San Marino, to the Huntington Library. And I've always, this is a a page from a book that I edited, um, Green Makers. And I also, and also what I thought was fascinating was there was a couple that lived in the garden when it was there in 1908, who then they served tea and they took, you know, they wore kimono and all this kind of stuff. So I thought, what would it feel like to be in that kind of situation? Um, 
I did a story later um, specifically um, looking into two families that played a role in the garden. And one of them was the Goto family. And it turns out actually uh, one of my uh, high school teachers uh, was like, this is his great grandma. Wait, let, let me see. This is his grandmother. Um, and uh, it, so his father actually lived at Huntington Gardens. He lived in that Japanese house. And um, so I got a little more information. And I, you know, this is where, when I was talking about gaps, we don't know what was going on in, you know, the grandmother's head about how she felt about being kind of exoticized in this way. So that prompted um, the short story. So I'm going to read from three little sections. And um, just to give you examples, if you have any questions, um, we can, I can address them. So this is the be beginning. Five cents. Pardon me? Five cents, mister. I jumped in to help my mother. The mustache patron wore a blinding white suit with a navy blue string tie fastened around the collar of a striped shirt. His straw hat was tipped to shield his pale, blotch, splotchy face from the Southern California sun. Grasping his elbow was a proper madame with a bouffant hairstyle and a long pink flowing dress. Over her shoulder, she balanced a pastel yellow parasol, long tassels hanging off of its edges. Okasan lowered her eyes, ashamed that she could not be understood. The obi around her waist was tight with her kimono. Because she was so padded, only my father and I knew that she was pregnant. My father insisted that she continue to work because most visitors to the Grand Garden in Pasadena, California, expected to see a Japanese woman in a kimono. The patron placed two nickels on our wooden counter. So this is the beginning. This is a this is like a, a few pages afterwards. This is kind of um, giving uh, my protagonist, who's up to now still unnamed, a little more context to his world. There was only a handful of Nisei children in my school. One was the son of a laundryman in downtown Pasadena, a few blocks north. The business took up the first floor of his building, in the back were Japanese women, their faces flushed from the heat, bent over ironing boards that flipped out from the wall. The smell of starch permeated the crowded room, and after a while, beads of sweat collected on my forehead from the heat and humidity. So just referring back to the last year's workshop, remember um, different senses. So not only sight, but, you know, we're seeing that these women, their faces are flushed from the heat, but then there's the smell of starch. And he, the protagonist has beads of sweat on his forehead. So that's kind of touch, I guess. A few of the laundry workers folded the billows of bleached bed sheets that would be delivered to the area's luxury hotels. Quinteros lived upstairs in rooms carpeted by rugs from East India and slept in the actual bed. My other friend, George, lived behind their nursery in a wood frame building that had planks on the floor. George's family also had a Japanese garden, but it was a small one, a point of pride for his father, but no one else in the family. So here I'm trying to show a contrast, like there was not that many Japanese in Pasadena, Nisei, but the ones, but they all lived very different lives. Kentaro, you know, he's sleeping in actual bed. He's a little more, he's a little bit wealthier. George is a typical nurseryman, you know, and it's more working class and they have a garden, but it's not like the type of garden that the protagonist is living in. So this is the last section um, that I'll be sharing. The next Monday I was on the schoolyard with the other Nisei boys when Nicholas and you, I introduced Nicholas earlier, he's a white boy, wearing suspenders over his white shirt, burst into our circle. My brothers want to go to your Japanese house. I said nothing at first. Scabs had already started to form on my back from my father's thrashing. Did you hear me? We'll be coming to your Japanese house today. You'll have to pay a nickel each to get in, I told him. 
Nicholas shirt tail stuck out from his pants. You don't want the whole class to know that you live in a, this is a slur, house, do you? There he made the ultimate threat. If the secret of my residence became public, I imagine boys breaking into the garden, throwing rocks at the house and climbing up the bell tower. My family and I would be tormented on a regular basis. I was now beholding to Nicholas until he became bored with my curious living situation. After school, we'll meet you there, he stated. So I talked to, I mentioned the inciting incident. I mean, there was an incident right prior to this where Nicholas does go into the house. And now this, it, the tension ramps up because now he's going to bring all his brothers. And um, there was some damage that happened by a, a sword that Nicholas was playing with. And so the protagonist's father had uh, beaten the protagonist for this. Okay. So per, I mentioned earlier, you want to pick a protagonist with some kind of weakness, a problem or challenge and a goal. And another person who threatens the completion of that goal. So for our protagonist here, um, we're learning about him. He's protective of his immigrant mother. You know, he she's pregnant, and then these visitors come. She can't speak English that well. He's trying to fill in. He wants to blend in with his classmates. That's another challenge. And he doesn't want outsiders to enter into his house. So who's invading is, is Nicholas. He's preventing... Um, the protagonist from getting his goal. So that's going to be uh, the conflict in the short story. So um, just, just for fun, <laughs> this, this time is for you right now. Let's see. We have, I'm going to give you 10 minutes or maybe I'll give you seven to 10 minutes. Now get that piece of paper and then look at, you know, the first location that, popped out at you start with there and um just put a person in that setting this is an exercise we did in the in last year's workshop and then add another person and just see what happens so let's as an experiment let's do this for um seven to ten minutes um and let's start now and while you're doing this i'll be sharing um slides that um mike let me see. I'm going to stop share and then go back to this. So yeah, start writing now and just see what you come up with. And then we'll regroup in like seven minutes. And if you have any questions, just put it in the chat.
Oh, I'm sorry. Someone asked first person. There, it could be any any POV that you wanted. Let's kind of slowly come out of this. And um, if you in the chat can just say how how has it been to just think about this? Was it difficult? Was it fun? And also mention if you did actually tr attempt to write something can you write about what location you chose and also if you want to say it out verbally just raise your hand and we could unmute you too Hi. Hi. Um, my challenge was to kind of have a real situation, which I went to Little Tokyo for an art exhibition by Japanese artists, or start with kind of idea of racism. Somebody saying, oh, Chinese, Japanese is the same. And I'm like, I was kind of stuck to start with an idea or just real or fiction. So it was challenging for me. I couldn't. Now, um, do you live here in Los Angeles? And But you do, uh, you did go for an art. Are you an artist yourself? Oh. Oh, uh, can you unmute Karen? Someone un unmute her. Yeah. Oh, wait. You're still muted. Can someone unmute Karen? Okay, yeah. Hi, sorry. Um, I'm Armenian. I have lots of Japanese friends. Yes, Sakata-san, famous artist. I went to his exhibition. Um, I've been to Little Tokyo a few are, times. Are you an artist yourself? Photographer, yeah. But to, you know, and have you written uh, short stories before? Um. Nonfiction, mostly I'm working on it. I take classes, yeah. I would start with what you feel the strongest about. I mean, you, I would bring in your photographic, you know, expertise or your artist, artist. I mean, if you yourself entered into Little Tokyo through art, you know, just why don't you just start from there and just see what happens, you know? Um, but thank you. Thank for thank you for how did you hear about this workshop? Facebook. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I get emails from Japanese uh, and I met the Japanese Consul General, a couple of connections. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank and you. another thing is if there's any kind of intersection um between like Armenians and Japanese or Iranian. I mean, that would be. One, um, I love this one writer. His name is David Mas Masmoto. He lives in Fresno. Yeah. Um, and he's a peach grower and he also had grown uh, grapes. But he, you know, there were a lot of old time um, Armenian farmers, right? So he 
he wrote about that intersection. And if there's something in Los Angeles, maybe you could write with that. That would be really fascinating. Actually, there is. Two years ago, there was a big event, uh, Armenian Consulate General and Japanese cultural event at the Armenian Church. And this UCLA uh, doctor who goes to Armenia every year implant hearings for children. So there is lots of things happening. So your, your challenge I know is, that. <laughs> your, your challenge is if you're going to do fiction, you got to figure out what is the personal story, not just, yeah, all that. But thank you so much for sharing. Vivian says she was taken by the photo of the bookmobile and the ladies in the kimonos. Yeah, it was fun to imagine being an eight-year-old standing there with her grandmother. I wrote a few, few paragraphs. Yay, Vivian, that's wonderful. I really liked that photo too. That was really amazing. And Lee um, said it was fun to be inspired by the photos. Lee, do you want to say a few words? I think you're unmuted. I don't know which Lee this is. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I let's see. I think I was kind of taken by the uh, Atomic Cafe photos. I recently saw that documentary. Did anybody see that documentary? Yeah, and that that looks so fun. <laughs> so I was struck by that. Had you gone to the? Mm. Have you ever been there when uh, it was open? No. No. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't even actually know about it until I saw the documentary. Oh, but it like awesome. a really cool place. Yeah. It was very cool. Yeah. That's fun. Okay. So Kristen, she says, I'm amazed I was able to come up with characters and a basic storyline in seven minutes. Yay. Actually, I think you had a little less. I kind of cut it short. Um, my story is going to take place at the French American Sewing School that was formerly located at 313 and a half East First Street. Mike, do you have anything to comment on this? Can we unmute Mike and so he can? Yeah, say well, it? you know, uh, there were a number of sewing schools in pre war little Tokyo, including uh, the students, including my, mater my paternal grandmother. So uh, kind of a backstory to her. She got married in Sacramento, uh, had had two young daughters. She divorced in 1924, came to Little Tokyo by herself. Hey, this sounds like a great story, the start of a story. She came to Little Tokyo by herself, uh, lived in a boarding house in Little Tokyo, went to a sewing school, met a man, young man, who worked at uh, Pacific Printing Company or Taiheo Printing Company. They eventually got married at the Union Church, and, and they lived in Boyle Heights neighborhood, just a couple of miles east of Little Tokyo, and my father was born there in Boyle Heights. So yes, there were plenty of sewing schools, um, and, and these young ladies, uh, what they created were, were just very beautiful, and then some of them were even hired by the high-end department stores in downtown or just on the outskirts of downtown. That's a great story this Kristen is going to write about. Yeah, yeah, please submit it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Mike and I, we, we don't have any influence on which story is picked. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we encourage all of you. Anybody else want to share? We have a few, uh, a minute or two. Um, yeah, I'm just really impressed that some of you were able to come up with this. And, and a lot of times you're just blocked, like, uh, you just you, internally you feel like oh I, I can't come up with something but sometimes when you have the pressure of like come up with something in five minutes then something happens magically happens so I would also encourage some of you if you really want to submit a short story you know reach out to an, somebody you know and um, they might help you keep accountable and, and they might you know, maybe you can say, I want to submit the short story by the end of February, uh, you know, and uh, maybe every week you could check in with that person and say, well, I finished two pages. I finished three pages. And uh, yeah, so there's the information. Um, Mike, can you want to say more about our contest and as well as the Little Tokyo Historical Society. Yes. Well, uh, well again, uh, there, there is a comment in the chat from Amanda 
She says, do you know of any references or anecdotes that uh, mention the friendly ghosts from the Japanese Union Church? Well, to, uh, to let everyone know, uh, little, the Little Tokyo Historical Society does its annual uh, Haunt a Little Tokyo tour or ghost tour. Uh, the last two years were virtual, but prior to the pandemic, we were doing it in person. In, and there are a number of stops along First Street North, that historic court that, uh, that does have spirits. Uh, but uh, I, I think if you wanted to do some research on that, you could probably Google a little Tokyo ghost or ghost tours and something will come up. Uh, maybe something from the historical society or, or from the Japanese American national museum. But uh, there's, there's plenty of, I think, information out there in terms of the contest. Uh, we, we, this is our ninth annual short story contest. And as a title uh, connotes, imagine little Tokyo. So just, be creative in how you approach this. Don't have put a lot of stress on yourself because it could take place past, current, or future, or all three time, time dimensions. And we've seen stories that just kind of bounce back and forth. So let your imagining just run wild. And I think you're going to enjoy it. And it's only 2,500 words. And if you're doing it in Japanese language, it's 5,000 characters. Uh, and the best part of this is if for the three categories, it's $500 cash prize and you get your, pub your uh, story published in the local Japanese American newspaper, the Rafu Shimpo, 118 year old um, publication, still in the heart of little Tokyo. And it's published on Discover Nikkei website. So go to good Discover uh, Nikkei. You'll see the past winners there as, long, as well as the videos. Um, if your, your story is chosen as one of the winners, then it will be read by uh, a, an, a Japanese American actor and will bring that story to life. So uh, we, we just hope that you participate in the story. The submission deadline is February 28th, 12 midnight Pacific Standard Time. So, Anything else? Yeah, Naomi? I think, well, we're, we're two minutes over seven. Oh, so okay. We should probably bring um, Elizabeth back on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are a few chats, but I don't know how we want to um, address I did, these. Well, uh, with Darren, um, she had asked about Bronzeville and I okay. told her, about Mar Martha Ga Nakagawa's okay. website with LTSC. If you just Google, actually, if you just yeah. Google Bronzeville Little Tokyo, a few things mm -hmm. will come out. There's some amazing photos on Shades of LA as well as, um, yeah, of, of Bronzeville. Does Shades of LA have the Herald Examiner photos? But the Herald Examiner uh -huh. had some amazing photos of that. As well as, and then I mentioned the finale club, and and Don Banai also um, talked about the Robert Shoji uh, documentary, of the mm -hmm. finale club, which is great. It's fantastic, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, oh, okay, Yoko. I'm, uh, oh yeah, oh these are all the stories. But I don't know, you know. I'm sure Discover Nikkei has had some articles on Bronzeville. Yes. You know, yeah, so. there, there's uh, material out there about Bronzeville. Yeah. So, um, oh, and Stephen Awakuni says he's pumped and we're so happy. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I always say this because uh, sometimes people uh, don't win um, or they're fine. You know, they get number two and they're disappointed, but it's an accomplishment just to write something. And we've had uh, a, one of a person who was not our number one winner. He's he's adapting his short story into a play, and I've been to a reading. Um, so, and then we've had some youth candidates who did not win, but they stuck with it, and they kept submitting sub, you know, subsequent contests, and they won. And so, you know, don't get too stuck on like. Oh, I did win. You know, just be proud that you finished something and you probably can get that short story maybe published somewhere else. So, you know, 
But anyway, uh, and that's all I have to say. Uh, Janum people, you want to come in now? <laughs> <laughs> I will wrap it up. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also here from the Japanese American National Museum and the Public Programs Department. Um, and on behalf of Jana, I want to thank you and take the chance to thank Naomi and Mike. Um, we love working with Little Tokyo Historical Society. Um, and so this is always such a fun and exciting program to do. So um, please join me in a round of applause at home. I see lots of thanks in the chat as well. but. I know we can't wait to see your stories. We can't wait to um, hear them read out loud at the <laughs> celebration. You can find past year's celebrations of the last few years on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so please stay safe, enjoy writing. We hope to see you in Little Tokyo soon. Um, and I'll leave the uh, call open for a little bit because I know we just threw a lot of links in there so folks can um, slowly start to drop off, but also stay on the links and we'll see you next time. And thank you so much again.